everybody. You're very welcome or good evening or good afternoon, given that I think we have a very uh, global audience uh, today for our guest speaker. Uh, my name is John Barry. I'm Professor of Green Political Economy and the co-director for one of the host organisations for today, the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action. And in conjunction with the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work, we're delighted to have you here at this morning's uh, talk and discussion. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Dr. John Karamikas, to introduce our guest speaker. And then we can have um, Stelios give his talk and then we have plenty of time, hopefully, for discussion. So over to you, John. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I know Stelios from the state school that we went together. We had the high school there. Uh, I'm impressed about his achievement and I'm really happy to invite him uh, for this lecture. Uh, he's going to give the per give an answer, if you like, in terms of the perennial question that we have. Can we compromise uh, environmental sustainability and climatic action with economic growth and employment? That's one thing. The other thing that we discussed with uh, Stelios recently is uh, he has become a father. So we discussed about nappy changing. That was the most important thing. And today is also the bicentennial by anniversary from the Greek War of Independence. That's the one thing. So I'm happy if you are happy to, if he's happy to start the, give me the lecture. Is that okay? Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you, John, uh, and thank you, John, for the introduction um, and for inviting me to give this talk. It's great pleasure for me um, to be able to interact with um, uh, students and academics um, in, in this setting. I have to say that uh, I missed this kind of interaction um, since I was at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, um, and since 2018, um, I'm with the Global Green Growth Institute. Uh, I, I always enjoyed the, the interaction and discussions in an academic uh, setting and beyond. So um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, this talk and to the discussion um, and Q&A afterwards. So let's see. Um, yeah, I would like to, to, to start with a question um, about how has your life changed in the last year? So please feel free on, on, the, on the chat room uh, to um, answer. And I think we all feel uh, that last year was a, a pretty um, significant year and very impactful. And um, I, I choose to start with this something that we all feel and experience. And I think to a lesser or to a um, higher extent, people's life, lives have been changed. Um, and Although coronavirus has been significant and had, has a significant impact in, in, in our lives, um, the question I would like to ask is, is it true a black swan event? Meaning that uh, an event that, that had a low probability to occur with a high impact um, in case of occurrence. The question is the question is simple and it's no. It's not a black swan event because science was clear. Science, uh, scientists, epidemiologists have warned us, have warned policymakers that this was about to come. So policymakers prefer to continue with the business as usual, prefer not to do anything and we are currently in a sad situation now that we are facing 2.5 million deaths 
we are um, facing already uh, the, the people of society that have lost their jobs and livelihoods. According to ILO statistics, around 11% unemployment income has been reduced with major um, economic consequences. So COVID-19 and COVID-19 crisis tend to be disastrous more, uh, also from an, um, a health, but also from a socioeconomic perspective. And what, what we have observed here is interesting when we discuss about any lessons learned that we can draw from COVID-19 crisis with regard to other crises that we are uh, facing currently. For instance, it's clear that this is a sign that the current system, the current economic system is not sustainable. Um, and, and here there is a question, uh, often we, we see from many, including policymakers, to want to, uh, and suggesting to go back to our regular lives. Um, the question is, if we really can, and if we really want to go to our old lives, and meaning our old lifestyles and practices, that in the end, those led us in this mess we are currently in. Um, as you see here, and probably you have seen that in, in social media, and it's a very well sketched the crisis, the multiple crises that uh, probably um, it seems are, are coming after the COVID-19, and certainly COVID-19 should be a wake-up call, not to go back to the business as usual, but really to get the lessons learned with regard to trusting the science, with regard to uh, working um, and co collaborating globally, uh, multilateral um, collaboration and cooperation to tackle global, global issues. And, and hopefully this will be a wake up call to change our system for the better and be able to tackle the crises that are coming. And I have to say that the crises that are coming and, and, and talking about the climate crisis, the, the impacts will be much more devastating. Just a little bit to give you uh, some um, statistics uh, and, and uh, uh, data from the current concentration of carbon emissions in the atmosphere, which carbon emissions are directly correlated with the increase of uh, Earth's temperature. So we see this uh, known hockey stick graph where clearly we see a rapid unprecedented increase of concentration of carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere, which of course we see this uh, being correlated with the extreme um, um, weather events and also uh, increase of average um, earth temperature. Now, I don't want to um, draw a very um, gray, situation you just see at the news and you just remember um, what has happened in 2009 uh, we had in 2018 uh, we had massive forest wildfires in the Arctic in Australia in, Cal in California intense droughts um, and yeah um, and certainly, uh, extreme weather events felt around the globe in different countries, including, let's say, India with floods worst in a hundred years. Cyclone Idai destroyed massively um, uh, main parts of Mozambique. In Korea, we had record uh, uh, heat waves and high temperatures, the same in Europe, so on and so forth. So the impacts of climate change, as some uh, a decade ago, scientists were predicting that will be felt in, in the future, they're currently here and we're all feeling them. So there is no doubt that 
climate change is, is human made. There is consent, scientific consensus on that. And we see that finally policymakers start waking up. The question is if this is if this is uh, the timing uh, is late or not. If we still have time to um, tackle the climate crisis. In addition to that, we have also other multiple environmental crises uh, and interrelated to climate change. What you see here is a picture, actually two pictures, that I took um, from the city of Seoul. Probably you cannot clearly see the city of Seoul because of smog. We have in Seoul, in Korea, we have often increased levels of PM 2.5 ultra fine dust, which is mainly due to the coal fire power plants that are being built and operated in the um, west coast of Korea. In addition to that, we have also the transboundary air pollution uh, when the wind blows from China, the industrial complex at the east coast of China also brings a lot of pollution to the city of Seoul. And what you can see here, this is our favorite application um, currently because Korea is back to business, so the economic is back to pre-COVID uh, levels. And we started looking again on the application to, to understand whether we will open our windows or we will wear a mask for air pollution, not only for COVID-19 to go out. I have to say that here in Korea in 2018, in, in, in days that their pollution was very bad, uh, obviously Koreans are all equipped with this application in their mobiles and they have also um, air purifiers at their homes to deal with this issue. This is a major issue, um, particularly in other countries of the world, which is much more severe in um, Asia, China, India. And according to the World Health Organization, seven, pe seven million people die from illness related to air pollution. There is the, the issue of air pollution is becoming a major one in Asia, from Mongolia and China to Bangkok. Um, politicians are talking about blue skies, and that will be a way also to tackle at the same time the climate crisis. So with one stone, we could hit two birds as the sources of air, local air pollution and greenhouse gas em emissions in many cases are, are the same. Um, burning fossil fuels, for instance, is contributing both to local air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So by uh, tackling or meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement, we could save at least a million lives per year by 2050. Also, the biodiversity and deforestation crisis are accelerating. We have seen according to the last report from the Intergovernmental um, Science Policy Interface Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that uh, one million species are facing extinction. And um, humans have altered 75% of the land on Earth. Um, I have to say that um, biodiversity, deforestation, those are also issues that interrelate with climate change that often um, ways to address climate change, uh, for instance, by afforestation or reforestation will also address biodiversity um, crisis. The question is, how can we avoid catastrophic climate change? How can we tackle this crisis given that science is clear? In 2018, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, clearly stated that in order to be 
and operate at a safe level, we need to limit the increase of temperature up to 1.5 degrees of Celsius. So what can we do to avoid this uh, catastrophic climate change? So in order to be able to reach and limit the increase of temperature up to 1.5 degrees, we need to reach by 2050 mid-century net zero emissions. Net zero emissions, it, it means we need to transform our systems, our economic system, our energy system, our, uh, the way we plan our cities, our urban systems, the food system, so on and so forth. And certainly we need to take actions in all those sectors to make sure that by 2050 we can reach the neutral the climate neutrality target. So um, I don't want to zoom in on, on all these sectors, but certainly we're talking about the transformation in the energy sector, acceleration and uptake of renewable energy technologies, storage and uh, smart grids to hydrogen um, uh, energy, to power our um, system. In addition to that, the way we build our cities, and I have to say that according to UN projections, our world is getting more urbanized. So we expect many um, urban areas to be built in the future, particularly in, in, in Asia, in Africa, so the way we will plan and design our cities, the way we choose the materials for the buildings and the way we choose to um, design our transport systems will determine to a certain extent whether we achieve the carbon neutrality target by 2050 or, or not. So um, we're talking about a massive exercise to transform our systems. But I don't want to, to present only a doom and gloom um, picture or a very challenging one. We have some good news here. The good news are that firstly, we, we see the last years, the last decade, the cost of tackling climate change keep on falling, plummeting. In order to transform our systems, uh, as um, um, we presented before, we have the advantage of technological innovation and falling costs, investment costs, that would allow us to um, invest in renewable energy technologies, for instance, wind and solar, uh, the last decade, the, the, their prices, their costs have gone down 80% around for utility scale solar PV, around 30% for wind energy. And to a certain extent, this happened uh, because of uh, policies that were in place, incentives, innovation, R&D in these technologies. And we expect the, the cost to further go down. And also we get the lessons learned on how to further accelerate innovation for other zero carbon um, energy and transport technologies. We have also low cost options, for instance, cycling, non-motorized transport, so designing our cities that will be um, um, cycle friendly, bike friendly, and also uh, citizens will be able to uh, enjoy also health related benefits of, of non-motorized transport. Certainly additional benefits will be, and this is the, the, the second 
main element of the good news is that the co-benefits of those measures, of those practices that we can employ in order to um, tackle the issue of climate crisis in the different sectors, at the same time we can enjoy different co-benefits. And of course this takes time. For instance, the designing a city um, that is um, uh, based on non-motorized transport like bikes and, and, and allowing pedestrians to walk open space open public spaces this is something that it, it requires quite um, quite a proper level of planning um, and I would say that for instance we have the capital of cycling uh, globally, which is Amsterdam, along with Copenhagen. Amsterdam, I, I guess many of you probably have visited this city uh, and you have seen that um, uh, most people there uh, cycle to uh, move from A to B. I have to say that Amsterdam and other Dutch cities were not always like that. So there was a process to make sure that cyclists will be respected, bike lanes will be constructed and, and secured for safety cycling. And there was a whole process in the 80s that people demanded to change and redesign the cities. In the 60s and 70s, the city of Amsterdam and other that cities, and I'm using this example because I had the opportunity to live there for a few years. Um, that time, it was a very different city. It was a car-based city because it was designed after um, um, in, in the 50s and 60s uh, as many other cities around the world. So the, the example of, of, of the Dutch cities that they have transformed, I think, shows also the way um, a good example of how other cities um, could follow this example. And talking about significant co-benefits, so health benefits with regard to changing our diets, health benefits because of cycling and walking, less noise, less local air pollution, less health impacts because of air pollution, more jobs, and less dependence on imported fossil fuels. Those are core benefits that can be locally uh, generated, and certainly those could be important ones and understood by policymakers in order to accelerate the climate action. Talking about jobs, so based on different studies, including um, GGGI study, we see that clean energy and transport practices uh, and technologies could create more jobs per unit of investment compared to fossil fuel based technologies. In addition to that, according to ILO, by following uh, a low carbon or zero carbon pathway to meet the 1.5 degrees uh, of, of um, increase of temperature, um, we can create 18 million more jobs compared to the business as usual. So it's not by, by following a, a zero carbon pathway, we not only tackle the climate crisis, but at the same time, we create jobs and we, we achieve many multiple local co-benefits. And if we add in the equation the avoided costs of climate change, so those impacts that will not happen because we tackle climate change, then the, the cost of the business as, you, as usual doing um, and following the, the current development pathway is completely outweighed by the benefits of the low carbon, zero carbon uh, development pathway. So costs of mitigation are plummeting, considering 
many co-benefits in related to human well-being and prosperity that are not captured and also avoided costs of catastrophic climate change will make a clear economic, socioeconomic case for going for a low carbon, zero carbon um, development pathway. Now, the bad news. The bad news is despite the fact that the science is clear, despite the fact that we have the knowledge, we have the technologies and practices, we have the economics. Despite all these things, we see that under the current policies, if we follow the same pathway, we're going to reach 3.5 degrees of temperature uh, by uh, 2100, which means that we'll, the, the Earth and the planet and humans will enter an uncharted territory. This is unprecedented. This have never been experienced, and it, it's very uncertain whether the planet will be livable and under which conditions. Now, um, I would like to pause a little bit here and ask why? Why these current policies? they're not ambitious. Why the governments and the private sector, despite what we um, mentioned before, still fail to take necessary, bold and ambitious action to tackle the climate crisis? When the science is clear, the economics is clear. So please, you can um, share some views in the chat room and, and we can also uh, discuss that uh, during the Q&A. I would like to, to um, address and uh, discuss a few issues in relation to, to this question. One important question is that um, until now, we measure um, economic development based on one metric, GDP, gross domestic product, uh, a, a metric that was established after the Second World War, when economies were devastated and, and the, the all countries uh, were looking for a, a economic growth um, and economic growth opportunities. Um, we have to say that this, this metric is not adequate for the challenges we face now. Actually, GD, and why is that? GDP is an aggregate me measure that aggregates all um, expenses with regard to economic activities. So we aggregate all economic expenses regardless if they are positive or negative. So for instance, if we go out at a restaurant and we pay that increases the GDP, but also if we clean the mess of an oil spill, for instance, that also costs, and these costs are reflected as increase of GDP. So uh, that this is a false signal because this is certainly negative. This is bad for the environment, for ecosystems, for humans, but it seems that increases the metric that we are looking at. In addition to that, GDP cannot capture distribution of income where who is benefiting from this increase of GDP. So is it an equal distribution or, or few? So all those aspects that are important to understand whether as, um, as a society we progress towards prosperity and human well-being are neglected are not taken into account or are taken into account in a wrong way, in a false way. There are different initiatives to address uh, and think 
and discuss alternatives to GDP. Here, uh, I'm presenting just one, the genuine progress indicator that in essence incorporates both economic, social and environmental indicators, but really deducts when we have negative environmental impacts. So air pollution, water pollution, those aspects um, um, uh, are deducted uh, from the uh, genuine progress indicator. The same with regard to crime, family breakdown, so on and so forth. So in essence, better reflects um, actually what we value as a society. And what we see here from a study that was conducted in 2013, looking on 17 countries, the, uh, comparing the GDP of 17 countries uh, versus the genuine progress indicator, we see that the GDP continues to grow after 1975, whereas the genuine progress indicator flattens and flattens because we have many negative environmental and social indicators um, uh, flattening the curve. So if we follow and if we have the GDP as our navigator, certainly is the false, is, is a perverse, is the wrong navigator. So certainly we need better metrics to capture um, progress. In the Global Green Growth Institute, we have also um, worked on this issue by developing the Green Growth Index that captures elements and dimensions of efficient and sustainable resource use, natural capital protection, social inclusion, and green economic opportunities, which is a more balanced way of, of, of measuring the, the performance of different countries. Also, I'd like to uh, briefly mention here about some initiatives from the UN um, Statistics Commission on an integrated environmental and economic accounting system. So going beyond uh, the just uh, measuring the, the economic uh, flows. So this system um, also measures uh, aspects of environmental flows, aspects related to uh, pollution, waste, and economic activities that contribute to, um, to the environment and biodiversity. An extension of this accounting system it, it takes into account something very uh, complex, accounting for ecosystem services. Uh, this is quite complex, but very important because we may extract resources, uh, for instance, uh, forests, and we degrade the forest, but um, uh, so we, we boost GDP, but we, we should also consider that the forest is also an, an ecological and environmental asset. By extending this framework, we are able to account, measure those environmental assets and, and value the ecosystem services that they provide to us. So a forest could also uh, filter uh, the water that, that people enjoy, uh, could um, also uh, capture carbon, so on and so forth. So uh, I think this is an important extension and, and something that can be uh, replicated further. Another important issue is that we are still, while we are in the middle of the climate crisis, governments still provide subsidies to fossil fuels. This is absurd. So phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and pricing carbon, because this is not for free, um, uh, polluters should pay uh, because of this um, global external cost and also air pollution. So those should be incorporated in, in, in the system. Um, so this is, uh, we have good experiences. There are countries that they're going through this fossil fuel subsidy reforms, which not only aims to reduce, obviously, emissions, but also redu re is reducing um, reliance of imported fossil fuels, increases budget revenues, 
where the countries and the governments could use for other activities in other sectors like education and health, or recycle these revenues for energy efficiency and renewable energy um, measures. Another important issue is that uh, not all humans contribute uh, the same way to global greenhouse gas emissions. This is related to our lifestyles. As you can see, the top 1% of income earners contribute most of greenhouse gas emissions. It's 15%. It's 48% uh, of emissions, the top 10% of income earners. So what does this mean? This means that wealthy um, uh, and high income earners uh, should really scale down or change their consumption patterns. And of course, this is something that we can also uh, discuss further. Uh, and this is important because this will allow also to the bottom 50% to develop and, and, and reach a decent level of, of, um, of progress. Um, one of the few um, uh, elements that um, I would like also to emphasize is the redesign of finance. So finance is very important. We, we public finance for for the level of of, of investments that are required cannot and are not enough um, to to tackle the climate crisis. So the how we um, incentivize the private sector and channel all those investments to, to the green sector, um, to, to sectors to uh, be decarbonized. This is an important issue. We have um, from the European Union recently, uh, the EU uh, taxonomy on, on really identifying which investments are sustainable in order to channel investments in the right um, in the right sectors, and here you can see what kind of activities could be considered um, given uh, the objectives that need to uh, to to meet. Uh, so should be related to climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, water marine resources, circular economy pollution prevention and control, biodiversity, so on and so forth. Um, there is still a heated debate whether certain transition, as they are called, um, fuels should be included or not. So I think the EU should really um, put the bar high as it um, uh, aspires to become the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. And I think could also show a, a great example uh, for the rest of the world. And um, closing, I would like to say and, and come back to the issue of, of um, what the science, the science is telling us about um, about the climate crisis. The science is telling us, the IPCC, that we have eight to nine years to act if we want to bend the, the emissions curve in order to be able to, to reach a carbon neutrality by 2050. So certainly this is our last chance now that countries and governments will be already started putting um, funds and money to to start the economy, hopefully a new economy. So all these funds should be allocated to a green recovery and certainly towards uh, a greener future. Right now, it's not very hopeful, as we see here, many countries they they have uh, put their their money in in, in fossil fuel based industries or in industries that they have uh, an impact. However, there are also some good examples that hopefully will be replicated. 
there is still time and and hopefully there will be more pressure to make sure that the that the recovery of the stimulus will be green and i'd like to finish and and mention that we need ambitious green new deals we need the green recovery and the, the race to net zero um, uh, we need leadership um, we have so far 32 countries that they have um, formally adopted net zero goals we have many businesses that they have set greenhouse gas emission targets aligned with the science and already we have a group of investors of around uh, responsible of around 47 trillion in essence have called for 161 biggest emitting companies to enact to reach net zero which is also very hopeful so i would like to to finish and say that um this is um a great opportunity um to this is a great opportunity for the future generations to act now and i have to say that the last two years that i became a father uh, i was always passionate about climate change but now i have one more reason to talk about climate change and act for the future generations thank you wonderful wonderful stelios thank you uh, so much and hello little person representing the future <clears throat> We're all here trying to do our best for you. Um, so colleagues, that was a very rich and uh, empirically uh, detailed, uh, lots of excellent suggestions and ideas. Stelios, I think certainly you didn't shy away from the challenge that we face in terms of the planetary crisis, mm -hmm. but also some indications of, of movements and, and, and ideas. Um, what I'm going to do, I have loads in, of questions, but I'm, I'm going to try and not abuse my position as chair and open it up to the floor. I didn't see any particular questions uh, coming up in, in the chat. There was lots of, of commentary. Um, so maybe, I, yeah, maybe I, I'll reflect back to, to you, Stelia, some of the um, commentary that was in the chat. Well, the first one is that everybody who replied said their lives were affected significantly by what's happened uh, in, in, in the past year. Then in terms of the question you asked as to why aren't governments moving on this? So we have David Smith, uh, who said that, that it's inertia, uh, it's a lack of, of understanding and disconnection um, and a, a lack of respect for nature and a flat denial of the problem. So there's one suggestion that there's simply a denialism perhaps within government about how bad things are. So maybe you want to respond to that, Stelios. Yes, um, on the first one, yeah, it's clear that uh, most of people have been affected significant, significantly, some more than others, some lost their beloved ones, some lost their jobs. Uh, so I think it's it's important again here to to draw some conclusions from the COVID-19 crisis, and that's why I think we're in the middle of a crisis. But also this could be an opportunity to get our lessons learned. Um, so uh, I really hope that this could be turned to an opportunity as a wake-up call and act against the next and uh, more devastating crisis, uh, which is the climate crisis. Now, on the uh, on the issue, on the question why the governments are not ambitious enough or are not doing much, um, lack of understanding, uh, lack of uh, awareness are certainly um, some some of the reasons uh, why this is happening. And I think it's, it's a lack of understanding of the, I think of the complexity of the topic. Um, it's lack of understanding also of the benefits of the climate action, something that often is neglected or not measured, not assessed or not emphasized enough um, because Climate is, is considered a global issue, 
So why we take action for a global problem, right? So I, I think awareness and understanding, as uh, the, the colleagues in the chat room mentioned, uh, is very important. And denialism, of course, we have seen that. Um, and we have to change that. Um, and, and I think um, th there are different ways. Um, also, the way um, citizens demand change and action could also address this denialism from, from uh, policymakers. So uh, I, I think um, the, the colleagues, yeah, very well uh, mentioned. I think um, also uh, politicians, they have a short term normally, uh, four years, whereas here we're talking about the about issue for, for decades and, 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 uh, and, and beyond, uh, where the benefits of tackling climate change will be uh, felt in the future uh, mainly. Um, so I think also we, we need to uh, take that into account and make sure, again, as I mentioned before, that we go beyond just the climate change benefits, but we see also the job creation, the, the, the improved health, um, the uh, better diet, healthier diet, um, and all other uh, benefits uh, that we can um, capture through climate action. That's great. Thank you. Actually, just on that point, there's another question in, in the chat actually from one of my PhD students, Callum McGowan, who's asking the question that um, the imperative of orthodox economic growth, even though you quite rightly said we need to move beyond it, that that constrains the, the, the envelope of climate action still. So I wonder if you want to reflect upon that, that actually there are uh, economic growth, under, even understood in an orthodox sense, is still kind of setting the limits to the ambition of climate action and decarbonisation. Well, um, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, certainly, um, certainly we should um, act by respecting the the planetary boundaries, right? Um, so, and when we are talk about when we're talking about climate change, the planetary boundaries have been set by um, IPCC and 1.5 increase of um, uh, Earth temperature is considered a safe boundary. Um, obviously, um, economic growth shouldn't be um, the end. Uh, should be the objective itself. Um, however, for certain countries, like low-income countries, uh, this could be really, um, uh, by following a green growth uh, development pathway, uh, I think, uh, and giving them some space to grow um, and um, leapfrog towards uh, zero carbon or low carbon, um, uh, technologies in the in the different sectors um, is very important. On the other hand, uh, developed countries um, again, what matters mostly is also how we we measure the, the our progress. So uh, I think uh, these countries also they could allow um, they can have less growth in in the sense of the. Oh, of the um, GDP per se, uh, and, and focus more on the quality of growth, more on the on on the well-being, on on prosperity, on happiness. Uh, talking about happiness, we have also the um, uh, National Growth Happiness Index from Bhutan. So we still have some uh, alternative ways of looking on 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 progress and measuring uh, progress. Um, so there are limits to, to economic growth and, and those are set by science. Um, and in the case of climate change is 1.5 degrees um, of Celsius. Aye. 
I mean, I think it's a good point here maybe to uh, mention something that I'm sure you're aware of, Stelios, and maybe others on the call, that when you're mentioning planetary boundaries, of course, the famous paper by Rockstrom and his colleagues, that actually I think Kate Rayworth, I think yes. quite rightly introduced this kind of donut model that as well as the ecological science-based planetary boundaries, we also need to talk about a social floor uh, and so issues of equity and, and human rights and, and meeting human needs. And again, it's interesting because you mentioned Amsterdam as the cycling capital of the world. Well, people on the call might be interested to know that Kate Rayworth's model of the donut is being applied now to Amsterdam. Uh, I think it's the first in the world. And so it's another indication of the pace of change and rather hopeful in terms of a sustainable economy. But of course, what's often missing about um, our understandings of these issues of growth and degrowth is that it's compatible um, with the planetary boundaries and social floor for some sectors of the economy to grow and others to decline. You know, part of what we're looking at on the energy sector is the, is the phased and just transition of the fossil fuel sector to decline over years while we grow other parts. So I think it's often a mistake to present this simply as a growth anti-growth position. It's about which sectors of the economy we want to grow and which do we want to retire. So I, I want to bring in Paul Andrews in a moment, but perhaps you might want to respond to that, Stelios, this idea of the of the donut and growing certain parts of the economy while retiring others. That, that's that's an excellent point, uh, and I'm very glad you you raised that. Um, yes, the the growing certain um, sectors of the economy while phasing out others. So I mentioned before phase, phasing out uh, subsidies in, in fossil fuels and eventually phasing out of fossil fuel industries. So um, I didn't have time to touch upon that, but but uh, I'm very glad you, you're raising that, the issue of just transition. So uh, as we're moving towards uh, 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 restructuring or redesigning uh, our economic system, some sectors will be uh, reduced or diminished, like the coal mining and, and uh, coal-fired uh, um, based technologies. And certainly we shouldn't leave those people behind. Uh, also, when we design policies like pricing carbon, right? increasing um, uh, pricing of fuels, we should always keep in mind those that will be affected. So we, we, we can in, incorporate and introduce smart policies that at the same time take into account those that will be affected and also designing them in a participatory way. So uh, the just transition is a very important concept. This is uh, certainly um, one of uh, uh, the main um, issues we prioritize also in GGI, uh, also uh, other international organizations like the ILO. Um, the idea is to really um, include in this transition those that will be affected, uh, make sure that will be compensated um, not only, um, you know, financially, but also uh, make a plan and, and, and introduce policies to identify which skills are needed in this um, uh, energy transition, how we can uh, retrain or reskill those that will lose their jobs and see how they can be absorbed and work in, in, in growing sectors, talking about renewable energy here. Um, so, of course, um, there's, there will be winners and, and losers, like um, reducing sectors and, and increasing sectors. But based on studies, and I mentioned here the ILO study, but there is the new, uh, the new climate economy study, we see that um, by following a, a zero carbon emission development pathway, we, we can create more jobs than the business as usual, uh, net jobs, which means those that will be lost could be um, um, incorporated, uh, retrained, reskilled, and, and found, uh, um, um, you know, a contribution to other sectors. Of course, the, is the issue of 
um, location related issues and, and where the jobs will be lost and where the jobs will be generated. Uh, especially, this is also uh, an important issue to consider. So, in such a kind of studies, is important to to incorporate this special uh, aspect and again in um, design policies to to capture that. So, uh, I'm I'm very glad you you mentioned that. And of course, the donut economics uh, um, concept is uh, is a promising one, um, and it's great to see that the city of Amsterdam in a uh, which in a sense is progress progressive and I'm very glad to see that um, testing the donut uh, uh, economics um, paradigm in practice. Uh, so and we hope that will be a successful experiment that will be replicated uh, both in in high income but low income countries as well. And just on that, in terms of the um, the shift and how do we incentivize, in particular, the private sector, it's a question from Paul Andrews, um, who argues that there's a, a lack of financial support for a uh, Piketty Capital to shift from, you know, unsustainable to sustainable investment opportunities. And what Paul suggests is there's a lack of appropriate infrastructure to support private sector changes. So. I wonder, would you have any comments on that particular incentivizing and, you know, picky because this is a very costly investment infrastructure proposition in terms of the millions, if not trillions of euro or dollars that is going to be needed. So how may that incentivization of the private sector be achieved? I, I, I'm, I'm assuming Paul is asking. Yeah, that's um, a key question or million dollar question. Um, well, and um, as he insinuated, incentivizing the private sector is key here. Um, as you mentioned, we are talking about trillions, about uh, some estimates, four trillions per year will be needed really to um, um, address the, the required investments. And certainly the private sector has a major role to play, um, the finance sector, so on and so forth. Um, in se th th there are two points here. One is the, the issue of pricing that I mentioned before. It seems that, that still we uh, don't price certain activities um, how um, in order to reflect their actual costs. Uh, so still um, on fossil fuels, for instance, we don't internalize the air pollution costs health costs, climate change costs. So the pricing mechanism should certainly correct those. So that will be one way that that will give the right um, uh, pricing signals um, to investors also to see which technologies are, are, are uh, more costly or less costly. I have to say that right now, even without subsidies, in in many cases, renewable energy technologies are, are um, more competitive um, than um, fossil fuel based technologies. Uh, but uh, but one, one issue is the the, the pricing. So uh, it, it's very important. Um, we have also the environmental tax reform, taxing the bads and, and reducing um, taxation on the goods like uh, uh, labor taxation. Um, and in addition to that, how we we further incentivize the private sector and we channel the, these, these trillions that we want in, in the right uh, direction. I think um, the, the EU taxonomy that uh, I briefly touched upon um, is, a, is a great example which could be uh, a way to incentivize the, the the investors, the private sector, to invest in sustainable activities, in in climate mitigation activities, and and make sure that um, in order to be able also to um, to access certain funding, uh, their um, the, the the activities should be. Um, uh, sustainable. So there are different ways. Uh, I think still we have a lot 
a lot of work to do uh, in order to incentivize the financial um, the financial sector and the investors. Um, so um, there are also international organizations that are working on that. Uh, the UN, uh, the the UN um, finance uh, initiative um, on sustainable financing is is one of those. So um, I think that's a, that's a very important um, element. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and just picking up on and trying to summarize some of the discussion in the chat here is, is to move our focus now back to the state. In terms of some of the discussion in the uh, in the chat, uh, that actually what we need is well, I'll, I'll put it to you in, in, in very simple terms that we're looking at the death of neoliberal capitalism. That that experiment is now coming to an end. That's partly the cause of the unsustainability that we see. It's clear that as we come out of the pandemic, we're going to have a larger state in many countries across the world. That isn't going to change, and maybe that's a good thing because what we need now is a state-led jobs creation as as paul in the chat says and therefore i wonder um is what you're proposing particularly towards the end of your presentation stelios about the the green new deal and alexandria ocasio cortez and what's going on in, in america that's really a form of green keynesianism so this is not a neoliberal um capitalist you know recovery process but actually it's a much you know, older in some way, a kind of a 1950s style. The state is bigger. Uh, it's about regulating finance to serve the real economy. And that therefore what you're, you know, you could summarize what you're arguing for as a kind of a green Keynesianism. Uh, and, and maybe that's a misrepresentation. Um, so I'm just trying to summarize what's in the chat and on reflection of what you've said, that is what you're proposing is a state led process of green recovery where the market can be mobilized, but has to be regulated, particularly finance. And maybe in particular, we're looking at a a selective deglobalization that actually what we need to do is to start relocalizing supply chains and creating jobs as we, you know, address the planetary crisis. So a lot in there, Stelios. So feel free to pick pick the elements that you want to talk about. Oh, well, that's... uh... Also, very um, interesting uh, points. Um, I, I have to say on, on the green Keynesianism, um, w- we see that uh, after the pandemic, we 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 realize that, uh, and also after the financial crisis, um, it, it's clear that the current model doesn't work. Um, and, and right now we're in the middle of the crisis, and we need an an, an intervention. And and even the IMF has suggested, which normally IMF, and after the the uh, financial crisis of 2018, um, uh, we saw austerity measures being imposed in many countries. Um, so it seems that many now suggest for such a kind of big stimulus that should be green and also regulating um, and putting in place the right policies with regard to pricing policies, but also regulating the the finance in order to channel the the investments in the right direction. Um, I think, uh, of course, the, the private sector is very important here. And the idea is that uh, by um, um, by greening the the recovery uh, and having uh, and investing in in a greener economy, then the private sector could uh, follow on that and, and those and, and go from the billions to trillions that we really need to to tackle the the issue. So I think that the 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 magnitude here is is. Uh, it's important to understand the magnitude of the investments that are required. So certainly um, uh, the state cannot provide all this funding, but with the right interventions, with the right policies, should certainly direct and and steer um, the the investors towards um, uh, the sectors that need to be uh, decarbonized. 
Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I really think, and also in, in GGI, the uh, Green New Deal, uh, not only, you know, in the US or, or Europe, but in other countries, is certainly something that is is needed. And, and here we have the opportunity to make sure that any funds that they're uh, put in, in stimulus packages, they go to green activities, climate mitigation activities, uh, to decarbonize the, the economies. And particularly when we talk about low middle, middle income countries to, to an inclusive uh, green, green growth um, um, activities. No, thank you for that. Um, we have a question in here for uh, Vlasis, uh, who's talking, I think, in the EU about um, is there a need for much stricter, uh, I suppose, um, pricing against fossil fuel, um, prioritising, you know, particularly housing efficiency, um, because it's basically more efficient to change from oil to, to a gas heater and so on. In other words, should, should there be clearer rules to disincentivize uh, what's often called carbon lock-in? So it's, an, it's state intervention in shaping the market. And have you any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's um, that, that's also a great point, and um, I, I think it is in line with um, wh what I was saying before about phasing out uh, fossil fuel subsidies. That it's 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 really absurd that we still uh, subsidizing fossil fuels, uh, and uh, currently we have more fossil fuel subsidies than subsidies in renewables. Um, so certainly we need. Uh, to correct the, our pricing schemes and give the right si signals. Um, another point that was uh, mentioned, I think, was also related to um, energy efficiency. Um, so I, I think we we need first to um, look on all possible ways to save energy, to increase energy efficiency investments, Energy efficiency investments also create local jobs. I think it's a no-brainer to, to start with these activities. Also, when we talk about jobs we uh, for, for the energy efficiency sector, buildings retrofit, maybe low-skill uh, workers, uh, those that they have lost their jobs uh, currently. So uh, I think energy efficiency could be one of the first uh, and best options to um, uh, to to invest right now as a as a green recovery uh, option, and of course this will will allow uh, also um, households and citizens to enjoy uh, lower energy bills, and, and of course having um, less um, energy demand. Therefore, if it's uh, based on fossil fuels, less um, carbon emissions as well. I hope I, I captured or, or addressed the the comment or question. Yes, you did. And we're coming towards the end. And apologies, uh, colleagues who whose question we didn't get a chance to to read out. But I think just to pick up on one issue that's come up in the chat and for your final uh, reflection, Stelios, and it has to do with technology. And I think there is a, a complicated story between what I sometimes fear is a kind of a naive technological optimism amongst citizens and policymakers that whether it's geoengineering or carbon capture and sequestration, that somehow um, we will find a technological solution, which means we don't have to change much. And I think there's a moral hazard in that. But at the same time, as Lila was pointing out in the chat, it's technology that has enabled us to have this relatively low carbon exchange uh, yeah, this morning and, and this evening. And so the question I might want to put to you, Stelios, is whether what we need to engage with in terms of technological innovation is to move beyond the orthodox position, which I think is about de technologically decoupling growth from resource and pollution and move on to the much more exciting but very contested area of decoupling human flourishing from economic growth itself. Uh, both of which may require technology. And I just wonder, uh, would you, you know, recognize that path that the, the, the decoupling we're talking about 
is not simply resources and pollution from economic growth, but really it's about decoupling human flourishing from an orthodox understanding of economic growth. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. On, on, on the issue of, uh, of technological optimism, uh, yes, uh, often uh, we see that this technological optimism could lead to um, uh, doing nothing from, from a, a, a behavioral uh, change perspective. Um, and, and certainly this is something um, that is not enough. Um, uh, technologies, technological transformation is not enough. And we see that in many cases, and I will give the example here of um, agriculture and livestock. And I'm picking this example because clearly here, if we really want to reduce the, the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, in, in agriculture and livestock, we really need, so th there is no alternative uh, uh, um, uh, technology for enteric um, you know, digestion of, of in animals, right? So here, um, here consumption patterns, behavioral change have a, have a, a major role to play. So um, how we choose to feed ourselves um, so if we eat more red meat or not, or, or we have a plant-based um, diet, has detrimental effects on, on greenhouse gas emissions. So um, red meat, as many of you, I guess, know, uh, has the highest carbon fruit footprint um, of, of our diets. So changing our diet is certainly, you know, something... Uh, very important, but uh, that indicates also that uh, technological um, innovation is not enough to achieve the changes we want. So certainly changing our lifestyles, uh, choosing to, uh, you know, take the train instead of uh, airplane in Europe, for instance, for certain distances, choosing to cycle instead of taking the car, those are very important behavioral changes that also policymakers should, um, should target. Um, and, and certainly uh, we should not rely only on technologies. I think uh, technologies are not enough. Here we need action in all different levels. We need we need uh, technologies to decarbonize certain sectors. We need to change our behavior. Um, um, we need a government intervention. We need the private sector. Uh, we need citizens. We need uh, consumers to change the, the way uh, we consume. I think uh, all options are important and we shouldn't be optimistic for one side um, and, and neglecting the others. So, uh, and I would say also on different levels, at the international level, at the national level, we have the national determined contributions, countries um, um, in, in those um, reports that they submit to UNFCCC, they um, set their targets to reduce their, their emissions. They should become more ambitious as we see right now, they're not enough. Um, so we need more international pressure, multilateralism, it's very important. On the issue of um, uh, subnational level, what cities are doing, uh, but also uh, at the community and individual level. So uh, at all levels, we should consider uh, different actions. Now on deglobalization, this is Again, this is very important. We see after COVID-19 with the disrupted um, supply chains that many uh, companies um, and countries, they, they, they look for more localized supply chains or, or reg regionalized supply chains. 
So, um, and I would say this is a, um, you know, something that we observe. Uh, we cannot predict how this will um, evolve further, but resilience is becoming an important issue that we see also uh, different actors considering that. And um, um, I would say resilience versus efficiency um, it, it's it's also something that uh, we need to uh, rethink uh, and and reevaluate here. Um, so yeah, that's from from uh, my side on on this. That's wonderful, Stelios, and I, I I'll draw our our meeting. Um, to a close by by thanking you on behalf of everybody here and I'd like to particularly thank my colleague John Karamikas who suggested you um, for what has been a, a wonderful uh, presentation Stelios. I mean it's an old saying that you find in, in the Christian Bible that without vision the people perish and I think you've certainly you know offered some elements of, of a vision uh, for the future but I'm also struck by, you know, if people want to read some uh, uplifting, because we live in very dark times, you know, the, the pandemic, the rise of ethno-nationalism, um, and certainly the planetary crisis. But I, but I do think there are there there are signs of hope in in terms of uh, this great work, as I would call it, and that many of us are engaged in and trying to figure out a different paradigm. I mean, that's part of the interregnum that we're in now. We're moving out of an old industrial, uh, perhaps linear, simplistic, unecological view of the world and the economy. And we have a lot of, you know, you know, do we move beyond growth? Do we have a dashboard of indicators? You know, do, do we, you know, have ecological growth, green growth, circular economy? And I think these are all necessary uh, a, a varieties of new ideas that we need to investigate. And for me, Stelios, in particular in relation to uh, you know, the, the hope for the future you presented to us earlier on in, in your child. For me, um, there's a wonderful phrase in the Scottish novelist, if people know him. He's a man called Alistair Gray, and he had a wonderful phrase, which I think is very appropriate for us to leave uh, today on the basis of what Stelios has said. And basically, to paraphrase what he said, he said, we should transition and build and work as if we're in the early days of building better societies. And I mean, that I think is the hope that I think all of us on this call will will take from your presentation. But Stelios, thank you so much for giving up your family time in the evening. Uh, I wish you well and everybody else on the call. Stay safe, wash your hands and socially <laughs> and socially distance from the worst aspects of neoliberalism. Listen, take care, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, John. The pleasure is mine. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great discussion. Thank you.